everything good, it comes from you. Everything good, everything good, everything good, it comes from you. Everything good, everything good, everything good, it comes from you. right over here to the BAPS. All right, everybody say hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. And Charlie wants to give his life to Christ, be baptized today. Can we give God the praise for that right there? That's awesome. So I'm going to ask Charlie, he's going to repeat after me. You repeat after me as well if you're a follower of Jesus. Here we go. I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God. Is the Son of the Living God. I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ died. That Jesus Christ died. Was buried. Was buried. And rose again. And rose again on the third day. On the third day. And I accept Jesus Christ. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord. As my Lord and Savior. And Savior. Can we give God the praise for that confession of faith? that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, let's celebrate it one more time, church. Amen. It's my, my mic's on. Awesome. <laughs> hey, let's celebrate, Charlie, one more time, huh? Amen. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. And we are so glad that you are here with us today. Uh, if you're new with us, we uh, would love for you to fill out a Connect card. These cards really represent what our mission is here at RCC. We are all about winning people to Jesus, training believers, unleashing disciples. And we try to accomplish that in a multitude of ways uh, in following the Lord. And on these cards, you can find all different ways that you can get plugged in, whether you have an interest in serving, if you want to uh, find interest in plugging into a life group. Even if you want to be baptized, so there's a place there too. Um, go ahead and fill that card out and let us know you're here. Let us know uh, what your interest is and we would love to get uh, connected with you. On that same card, there's a place to request prayer because we're a praying church. We believe in the power of prayer. And we believe that all we have is because of the Lord's provision that has been purposed in prayer. And so we want to uh, live that out and we want to be an example of that, not just here in this moment of worship, uh, and time of community, but all throughout our lives to be an example of that. And so whatever it is in your season, however we can be lifting you up in prayer, please take advantage of that. Write that down. There's going to be a prayer team up here for, uh, in front of the stage at the end of service. You could come forward then, or we also have boxes as you leave service today. If you're joining online, you can submit that online. We will get them uh, in the same way, and we'll be lifting you up in prayer. And then if you're joining online, you can give online. If you're here in the room, we have these boxes that you can give towards alongside all these different ways on the screen of just continuing the movement of what the Lord is doing here uh, through just his church family resourcing that. And it's amazing uh, to be a part of it. And so thank you so much for your generosity. But at this time, we're gonna continue in this time of worship. And worship is not just the songs that we sing, it's the lifestyle uh, that we live. And a part of that is in remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross in a time of communion. So I'm going to invite uh, my friend Michelle out and she's going to lead us in this time. Good morning. If you did not pick up the elements, the little cup um, on your way in, please raise your hand and an usher will be happy to deliver one. You know, communion is an opportunity for us to stop and think and reflect on the depth of God's love. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have everlasting life. I was thinking, though, part of that believing has to include our acknowledgement of the evil, the sin, the disobedience that's in the world around us. And then that should lead us to reflect on our own personal shortcomings. Where do we fall short? How are we disobedient? Because it's that realization that leads us to see our need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what communion is celebrating. So as you take those elements, remember Jesus' words to his disciples. When you take the bread and drink the cup, he said that those represent his body, which he gave up for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, is our hope for that eternal life. Let's pray. God, our creator, you desire for us to be completely united with you, and we are only able to do that because of what you've done for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you continue to walk with us so that we can remain in him. You've told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to you except through him. Amen. Fight for me.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. See, please. My name's Nathan, one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to RCC, and we would love your first time here to come by and see us at the Welcome Center. We have a gift that we want to give to you. So if you're a first-time guest, we want to say a big welcome to RCC, and please come by and see us at the Welcome Center. Your generosity here in this church is making headway all over our community, and one of the things that we do is we want to be a blessing in the holiday season, especially during Thanksgiving, and we have Megan and Mills here to talk to us about that. You guys give it up for Megan and Mills right now. Hey church, I'm Meg and Mills and I love this time of year. There's so many great things. There's football, there's fun, there's fall, fe fall festivals, and there's a lot of really great holidays just around the corner. But for a lot of our friends in our community, it's a sad time. It can be a dark time for a lot of different reasons. And so we need your help to pour into the families in our community this year through Thanksgiving blessings. So we're gonna prepare 100 baskets of food for friends in our community so they can enjoy the holidays um, with a little, a little love and a little, um, a little less stress on their plates this year. And so we get the names for these families from a few different sources. We work through Father's Heart Ministry. And so Father's Heart provides food year round to families with food insecurity. We also work through Young Lives and Young Lives pours into the lives of teen moms who have chosen life for their babies. We work through our schools and we work through some families just right here in our church who might be having a rough season. And so we really need your help and Mills is gonna tell you how you can get involved. First of all, thank you to everyone who has participated in Thanksgiving Blessings Ministry in the past. You have truly touched the lives of your community, whether you've brought food in, you've helped us package it, or you delivered it. Thank you so much, and you guys know the drill. But if you're new to the church or you don't know how it works, out in the atrium after service today, there will be a table set up that has some little note cards on it. And on those note cards are grocery lists. And we ask that you take one of those cards and as you go out shopping over the next couple of weeks, you grab those items as well and you return them to the church by Sunday, November 17th. And it's important that we get them by the 17th because on the next weekend, the 23rd and the 24th, we will be sorting, packaging, and delivering the items out into the family, out into the community. And church, the holidays, they symbolize, the holidays are about hope and grace and love. 
And a lot of people, maybe they're struggling to find that this holiday season. So this Thanksgiving, let's spread God's hope, God's grace, and God's love into the community. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and offer the invitation. That was really good. I can't top that. So, but yeah, you can see Megan and Mills, they're going to be out there afterward. And I say this, hey, second service and third service, let's make sure the other services can't get one of those cars because we go ahead and get them all up today, all right? And so I want to encourage you uh, to do that uh, right after this service. Go see Megan and Mills. They'll be waiting for you to be a blessing to someone this Thanksgiving. Hey, last week, in case you weren't here, uh, we, I'll let people know we have a survey that's going on. And if you were not able to take that survey, I would love for you to get your phones out and hit that QR code right there. Hit that QR code right now. That helps me with a sermon series coming up in uh, 2025. So if you didn't take that survey, go ahead and do it now. Or if you don't have QR codes work, go to riverchristian.church slash surveys. And, um, and just take it. It's going to be really simple. It's going to be anonymous. Nobody's going to know who you are. It's just got some simple information. Like, do you know if you're male or female? It's really simple stuff. And really like for guys to help me out because a lot of the ladies help out, but love for the men to step up and just be honest with it. And nobody's going to notice you. And it helps me get ready for a sermon series coming up in 2025, which I'm excited about. On top of that, I don't know if you know this, but there's an election happening uh, soon. I don't know if you know that. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but one thing that we need to do more of uh, individually but collectively is pray together, amen, about our country and about the election. And we're going to do that next Monday, uh, not this Monday, but next Monday, November 4th at 7 p.m. We hope you'll come here for a night of prayer and worship as we just, as we, some of us are concerned and worried and whatever else, wherever side of the aisle or you're on, we're going to encourage you to be here because one thing we have is we have uh, God in common, Jesus Christ in common. Let's, let's, let's bring our country before his throne and ask him to continue to lead us. Uh, so I'm excited about that happening next uh, Monday. On top of that, we helped out uh, the people in Carolinas, obviously with hurricane relief effort, and we want to help out our own state. And we've been talking to churches, you know, what can we do? Because a lot of churches are still devastated from what Milton did as it went across our state uh, just a few weeks ago. And they have asked us, hey, will you give to a group called IDES? There's a lot of churches that we're affiliated with. IDES is, it stands for International Disaster Emergency Services. So what you can do is you can QR code that right there if you want to give 10 bucks, 20 bucks. That money goes straight to helping those people be a blessing in these communities that got just ravaged with floods. And you can also go to riverchristian.church slash hurricane. You can give. That money is going to go. It's not going to go to our general fund. It's going to be a separate account. And then we're going to send that money that gets put in that account out to help uh, people who are hurting right now in our own state. So if you're feeling God calling you to help, I would encourage you to go ahead and give by hitting that QR code or go to riverchristian.church slash hurricane. And we're in the series right now called Salty Grace. And what we're doing is we're looking at the very beginning of the Bible and seeing these epic fails in the beginning of the Bible. And when we learn about these epic fails, we learn this, that God shows up every time with amazing grace. Amen. And so let's just kind of talk about failure for a moment because all of us know a little bit about failure. I know it doesn't seem like that because what we do on social media is we post our, you know, our highlight reel. But the honest truth is many of us, we fail all the time. I know I fail quite often in my life when it came to education and even what happened in my graduate school. I failed in a lot of relationships. Uh, I failed in one time I tried to interview at a job uh, for a church that I just thought so much about and I didn't get accepted. And every time I see that pastor, I always give it to him. Like, I can't believe you did not hire me. You know, I'm still hurt by that. And it's worked out that, that I didn't, but man, I'm still hurt. You know, uh, I never forget uh, in high school, I had such a terrible driving record that I lost my license. Okay. In the state of Georgia, it tells you how bad of a driver I'm in. I am. And I still have a magnet, an RCC magnet on my car. So if I can have one, you can too, all right? I got a lot of failure in my life. And that's what makes me appreciate about the psychology professor at Princeton University. His name was Rohan Hossifer. And he became a really big deal because he talked and showed on social media his failure resume. He lives in a world like you and I do that's all about success. And he said, you know what? My life has been full of a lot of failure. So he posted all the times he tried to get in graduate school and wasn't accepted about all the funding he tried to apply for research, but he got turned down. He uh, posted about several essays. He was trying to get in academic journals, but they were not accepted. 
And the irony is that post about his failure became his biggest success because it went viral. And I still love the idea that he was trying to communicate because it's similar to what the Bible's doing. And by the way, you and I are going to communicate and going to connect more in our weaknesses and our failures than we are in our successes. I don't know if you know that, but if I come up here and brag about all the ways I I succeed in life, you're probably not going to feel very connected to me. But if I talk about, man, the heartbreak I have right now with anxiety, or I talk about struggles I've got with relationships right now in my life, you're probably going to connect with me more. And the Bible does that. The Bible tells the best story of all, but it it tells stories about people at their best and also at their worst. Because at the beginning of the Bible is establishing this need that we all have, right? And it's massive grace. We all need massive grace. Amen? So today we're going to look at one of the biggest failure resumes I know of in the Bible. And his name is Judah. He fails as a son. He fails as a brother right out of the gate. A little backstory, God promises Abraham this huge promise that everyone's going to be blessed through him. That promise goes to his son Isaac, goes to his son Jacob. So we got Isaac, then Jacob, and then Jacob had 12 sons from four wives. And, and, and so those boys uh, didn't all get along very well because Joseph was Jacob's favorite. So a sibling rivalry established and all of a sudden the boys could not stand their brother Joseph. Well, Jacob says to Joseph, hey, I want you to go check on your brothers. They're out there working in the field right now. And Joseph is on his way to check on his brothers. When his brothers see him coming, they basically say, here's our opportunity to kill him. I mean, they really were going to kill him. Because one, he's daddy's favorite. And the other is, hey, there's less, you know, more inheritance for us because there's less brother. One less brother have to spread it to. And so all of a sudden, uh, the favorite's on his way. And Judah speaks up but not like you and I would wish. Look what Judah says. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's do what? Say it with me, let's do what? Let's sell him. Like I did a lot of things my brother, but this was not on the table. I kind of, kind of should have read my Bible more. Maybe then, anyway, never thought about selling. So let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, our enemies, and not lay a hand on him. After all, he's our brother, his own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Now, Judah doesn't have a problem with killing him. He's just saying, hey, here's a technical way that we can say we didn't kill him, but also make some money out of the deal. So, so, so the, he's got no problem lying to his brother, or lying to his father, and sending his brother into slavery, putting some money in his pocket. He, he's just not, he's just, he, he's not just so, you know, showing contempt for his dad. He's showing contempt also for his brother and his dad. Because when he sends Joseph off, he's sending his dad into grief for the rest of his life. He knew it was a possibility. And Judah did it anyway. That, so that, that's the very first mention of, of Judah. And then as we keep talking about Judah, you're going to see his um, failure resume continue to get longer and bigger. Let me tell you something. Here's what happens next, next chapter. At that time, Judah left, look at this, he left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. Okay, this is the first time one of the lineage from Abraham through Isaac to Jacob, now to Jacob's boy. He's the very first one that leaves the family, that leaves that covenant family that believed in the promises of God. And Judah is the first, but that was not the only first he did. Verse 2. Then Judah met the daughter of a what? A Canaanite. A Canaanite man named Shua. So now he's the first not only to leave his family, but he's the first to go find a pagan wife. And look what happened. He married her, made love to her. She became pregnant, gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son named Onan. She gave birth to still another son uh, named Shelah. And it was at Kazib that that she gave birth to him. So he's the first to leave the Canaanites, I mean, for the Canaanites, leave his family. He's the first to find a Canaanite pagan wife who doesn't know anything about the promises of Abraham. In fact, Judah heard about these promises ever since he was a little baby. She could care less. And frankly, she makes no spiritual contribution towards the character development of her boys. Look what happens next. Judah got a wife for Ur. That's what you did. You find a wife for your son, his firstborn. Her name was what? Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was what? Say it with me. He was what? Wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Question, 
how wicked must he have been? I mean, I mean, because there's a lot of sinning going on in the book of Genesis that God has to put up with. And I want you to think about this. Oh, by the way, how weak must the influence of the dad have been, Judah? Now, we come to an interesting part of the story, and I'm glad that children who can probably hear aren't in the room, because in this culture, legacy, your name, your inheritance was a very big deal. And the practice was if a man died with no kids and he had a brother, the brother should go and marry, marry his widow. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad that this is not in play anymore, okay? So, so you're supposed to have children with your sister-in-law, who's now your wife, and we'll get the dead brother's inheritance, all right? So that, that, that line will get the dead brother's inheritance, and, and the name will continue on. The inheritance is everything. And so Judah goes to his son, Owen, and his second son. Now you go, you take Tamar as your next wife and produce children for your brother, now, Onan has no problem being intimate with her. He's fine with that. What he doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to make babies with her. And you go, why not? Because the inheritance right now of Judah's inheritance is only between Onan and his brother Shelah. So if they have another brother, then the inheritance will go from you know, 50-50, it'll go to 30%. So I don't know how to say this delicately. So Onan and Tamar got together when it came time for a man to do what it happens for a wife to get pregnant, he stops the union. You can read it for yourself in the Bible. I'm not going to describe it. I want you to know, though, we're not going to ever do this story in our kids' ministry, okay? This is never, never going to be in our kids' ministry, but it's right there in the Bible. And look what the Bible says about Onan. What he did was what? What he did was what? Wicked. In the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Now ask yourself, where did Onan learn to think so selfishly and to think so little of his brother? Who's his daddy? You don't think that there are rumors going around camp like, didn't you have another brother, dad? And whatever happened to Uncle Joseph? Whatever happened to him? He learned it from his dad because his dad failed as a father. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to find out that somehow Judah fails more as a father-in-law. So he looks at Tamar, and he's lost two sons, and, and, and he thinks to himself, you know, you would think a reasonable person would go, man, I've lost two boys, they're so wicked. Maybe I have something to do with that. Maybe I need to get my act together. That's not what Judah does. What he does, he interprets the death of his sons through the superstitious lens of Canaanite thinking. That's how far he's drifted from the Lord. He reasons that Tamar is the problem, that she must be bad luck. And so he says to Tamar, you go back to your daddy. Now, what's interesting is actually she's his responsibility. But he's sending her off and he says, hey, here's what we're going to do. When my other son gets old enough, I'll have the two of you marry. He's totally lying. He has no intent on keeping that promise. So she waits and she waits and she waits some more. And Judah has displayed this total lack of character. And Tamar decides, you know what? I'm going to use that to my own advantage. What happens next is Judah's wife dies. He mourns. And I don't know how to say this, but just to say it, Judah basically says, I want to be with somebody. So after the sheep are sheared, think about spring break in Daytona, all right, where my wife's from, all right? It was a practice back then that during the sheep shearing time, you throw these wild, big parties. Judah decides to go. Tamar hears about it, and so she shows up dressed like a prostitute. Well, Judah is, is going to the party, and he sees her standing across the road, and she doesn't have to say anything. She knows him. All she has to do is be at the right place at the right time wearing the right clothes. Now, what's interesting is while this story is going on, another story is going on with Joseph. You can read about that in the next chapter. Joseph gets pursued by a powerful woman in Egypt, and he refuses her. Why? Because he's a man of character, and he fears the Lord. Judah is not a man of character. He walks across the road and he says, come sleep with me. He doesn't know that he's talking to his own daughter-in-law. This is really weird, all right? You think it's like Mississippi or something? I don't know what's going on. This is in the Bible, okay? She says, you know what? It's gonna cost you a goat. He's like, I don't have a goat. So she says, well, how about this? Get some personal items to guarantee that you'll pay me a goat later. And he's like a goober. He goes, okay. So they get together. 
She goes back to her father's house, puts on her widow's clothes. Three months later, Judah finds out that she is pregnant. He loses his marbles. The jerk is so hypocritical. Here's what he says. She has been unfaithful. She has been promised to my youngest son. Let's bring her out and burn her. Let's set her on fire. That's what the Bible says. Can you believe this? But Tamar is way too smart for Judah. Look what happens. As she was being brought out to be burned, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you, Judah, recognize whose seal and whose cord and whose staff these are. Judah recognized them because they're his. And said, she's more righteous than I since I wouldn't give her to my son Shalah. And he did not sleep with her again. Wow. What do you know? The jerk got jerked around. I believe this is the turning point of Judah's life. That Judah's resume gets a lot better from here on out. He never sleeps with her again. He takes care of her. He takes care of those boys, those twin boys that she births as, her own, as his own sons. And from this point on, he walks as God intended him to walk. It's pretty amazing. Now, what's fascinating, we're going to cover some ground, is while that's going on, Joseph in Egypt is rising up to number two in Egypt. And one day, uh, Jacob back in Judea realizes they have no food, but Egypt has all the food. So he sends the boys all the way to Egypt to get food. Now, one thing leads to another. They don't know it's their brother Joseph they're talking to in Egypt because he doesn't, you know, he looks like an Egyptian. He speaks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. Like he doesn't look like, you know, one of them, all right? There's a corny 80s comment there. Anyway, so anyway. He says, hey, is there any more family left? And they go, one brother's dead, not realizing they, they're talking to that brother that they think is dead. And then the other brother, we have another brother, and he's daddy's favorite. He's still back in, at home with dad. And, and Joseph says, you need to go get him if you're going to have any more food. They go and get Benjamin. They come all the way back to Egypt. And, they're, and Joseph throws them a wild party. Once again, they don't know it's Joseph. And while the party's going on, he says to one of his servants, he says, hey, sneak one of my goblets in the youngest one's sack. After the party, they go take off with all the food back to daddy. And on their way back to dad, all of a sudden that that servant shows up and he says, y'all stole from us. They go, we didn't steal anything from you. And they look through the sacks and sure enough, they find the goblet in Benjamin's sack. And now they're desperate. They go back to, they go back to their brother in Egypt, Joseph. He says, uh, you know what, you all, all 10 of you, because there's 11, all 10 of you can go back, but Benjamin, the youngest, he has to stay here in Egypt. He's going to serve as my slave for the rest of his life. What's Joseph doing? He's trying to figure out if his brothers have changed. Are they going to also hand over another favorite of daddy? Or are they going to do something daddy, uh, different this time around? Are they going to treat him, uh, Benjamin, like they treated Joseph? Guess who steps up this time? Judah. Here's what he says, verse 33. Now then, Judah says to his brother Joseph, not knowing it's Joseph, please let your servant remain. What's he saying? I'll stay in his place. Let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave. He's saying that to his own brother, not realizing it. And let me stay as your slave in place of the boy and let the boy, my, my brother, Uh, Benjamin returned with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. Who is this guy? This is Judah. Judah the jerk. Judah the failure who always puts himself in front of his own family. This is Judah who says, let me take his place. Let me bear the penalty of a crime that someone else committed. If you keep reading, you find out that Joseph like broke. I mean, Jacob, I think uh, Judah's like response like just melted Joseph. He realized he was different. He reveals his identity and they have this beautiful family reunion. It's a wonderful story full of grace truths. And as we close, let me go over these grace truths with you real quick. Number one is this, God is reliable. Everybody say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. God is reliable. Because when you look at these stories, As soon as God announces his global redemption plan to reach and bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham, I want you to realize this. It's not going to depend on the faithfulness of this family. (laughs) 
This family's not very faithful. It's going to depend on the faithfulness of our God. That Jesus is not going to be holy because of the DNA of his forefathers. Jesus' family tree has got a lot of bad branches on it. So I want you to see that we never should underestimate the resolve of God when it comes to fulfilling his purposes and promises. Now, God prefers to accomplish his will through obedience. That's for sure. But if he must, God will channel his will through the disobedient. In fact, he says through Isaiah these words, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and say with me, church, I will do all that I please. I know several of you have been on cruises. And one thing about cruises, you can make stupid choices on a cruise or you can make wise choices on the cruise. But no matter what choices you make, that captain is taking that ship to its final destination. So is all the universe. God is moving relentlessly towards his announced eternal plan. God is going to redeem his creation. And the future is going to take on the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is where God is taking history. Now, you can cooperate with that plan, or you can refuse it. But know this, God is going to accomplish what he said he would accomplish, because he is reliable. Here's the thing, along the way to doing what God said he was going to do, he's going to use people like you and like me who have some pretty jacked up resumes. Which takes us to the very last thing about Judah. Judah. Judah gets blessed by his dad. And, and who's going to get the blessing, like the ultimate blessing? Because the promise goes from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. Which one of the 12 boys is the blessing going to come through? Which one is the Messiah going to come through? Well, you may be already ahead of me. God picked, guess who? Judah. The scepter will not depart from whom? Say it with me. From who? Judah. Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one, that's Jesus, to whom it belonged, the one whom all nations will honor. Jesus was gonna be a son of Judah. Why in the world would God pick Judah? Well, you could say, well, because he changed his life. That's true, maybe. But I think he picked Judah because of all the brothers, he had the worst resume. I think God is making the point over and over and over again in the beginning of the Bible, you got to be saved because of my grace. Which leads to the next grace truth, and here it is. God is showing us that man is redeemable. Man is redeemable. By the way, you need to know that your history does not shock God. I don't know what you're covering up on your resume, and by the way, God knows the truth behind our resumes. I don't know what you're covering uh, uh, up right now with your resume, resume, but know that God has already read it. And he didn't say, oh man, I can't believe they did that. God has never seen a resume that intimidated him. Because God has an answer for all of our epic fails. Martin Luther, they say, is walking around one time and the Satan comes up. And Satan's got this long list of all these words and Martin Luther looks at the list and he looks at Satan and he says, what is that? And Satan says, I've made a list of all your sins. And Martin Luther looks at Satan and says, oh, the list is way longer than that. You need to go do your homework. And then days go by and here comes Satan again with a longer list of Martin's sins. And he says to Martin, now what are you going to say about that? And Luther said, here's what you're going to do. I want you to write in red ink on that list, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me of all my sins. And he does the same thing for you. Paul is talking one time to some people in Corinth. In fact, a group of us are going to be in Corinth later this, uh, this, this week. I can't believe it. And we're going to be in Corinth. And there he's talking to our brothers and sisters of Christ back in the day in Corinth. These people have some jacked up resumes. And he tells them, he said, this is what you did. You were sexually immoral, you were greedy, you were gossips, uh, you, you had integrity issues, you were idolaters. That's what you were, these horrible sins. And then he says this, and that is what some of you were. 
But say it with me, church. But you were what? You were washed. And you were what? Sanctified, made holy. You were what? Justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. See, God doesn't deem anybody hopeless. He doesn't deem anybody beyond repair. Everybody is invited to be part of God's redemption story. So let me be blunt. If, if, if you don't think, you know, God can ever get past your resume, and some of you in this room are like that. If you don't think God can, can know everything about you, you don't think God can still redeem you, who do you think you are? Seriously, who do you think you are? That your fail is more massive than the grace of God. Family, Jesus didn't just come for sinners, like he came from sinners. And one of the first things you see when you read Matthew's you know, family tree of, of Jesus, right there in the beginning of Matthew, is guess who one of Jesus' great-great-grandfathers was? It was Judah. And who did he have the child with? Tamar. The Bible takes one of the most perverse stories in the Old Testament and puts it right at the beginning of the New Testament and says this to you and me. This is the kind of Savior you have. Jesus came for people like his own family. Because guess what? We all need grace. I know it's hard, it's hard, you know, having something in your past that you're so ashamed of. I get that. And you're worried, you know, that you'll, you'll ever move on, you'll ever get over it. So let, let me be just really clear as I can to you. There is no way, there is no way God can be dissatisfied with you. And you go, what do you mean by that? Because if you're in Christ, if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, God is totally satisfied with Christ. He's totally satisfied with the atoning work that Christ did on our behalf on the cross. And for in Christ... It is impossible for God to be dissatisfied with you. And so we want you in Christ. You're like, how do I do that? We got baptism week coming up in just a couple of weeks. And if you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to go ahead and take that next step. You confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, just as we got to watch a second ago with Charlie. And you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We talked about last week, put on those new clothes. And I promise you this, God is completely satisfied with you. So go ahead and register. You can hit the QR code right there. You can go ahead and go riverchristian.church slash baptism. We got people right now signing up for every service. You're not going to be alone. If you've never been clothed with Christ, I want to encourage you, that, that's your next step. Because guess what? I don't care what you've done or who you are, you are redeemable. Which leads to the next point, and that is this, grace is remarkable. As I read the Bible, I see one story after another story of the fails of people. I'm not shocked by the fails, but I continue to be shocked by the wonder of grace. At the time, I think I, think I got how amazing God's grace is. God surprises me all over again. In fact, if I could summarize the gospel in one sentence, I would say this. The scandal of redemption is a redemption of scandal. It's scandals. I mean, the scandal of redemption is redemption of all of our scandal. That's what's so shocking about it. The scandal of what God is doing is saying that your scandal is not bad enough. Your scandal is not deep enough. Your scandal is not wide enough. You can't scandal beyond the reach of God's grace. There's a story about a, a family, a, a class uh, that happened in college, and the professor is telling the students, you know what, you've got a hard final coming up. It's going to be over the whole book. And the students were stressed out, and some of you know what that feels like, and all of a sudden, the, the day of the final shows up, and they come walking in the room, and they see all the, all the finals turned over upside down at each one of their desks. And so they all sit down at their desk, and, and at the appropriate time, they're supposed to turn over the final and start taking the test. And, and the professor says, you can now begin taking your test. And as the students turned the test over, they were completely shocked because every question on the final had already been answered. And at the very top of the final was a big old A+. Plus. And the professor said this, this test has been already done for you, has already been completed for you. 
and, you, and by someone else, and every answer is right, and every single one of you get an A plus, not because of anything you've done, but because of what someone did on your behalf. You have just experienced grace. And I think to myself, one, is that I never had a professor like that. That would be nice. And number two, here's the thing. One of the mistakes we make about grace is we say, you know what God is doing in grace is God has given you a second chance. Let me be honest. You don't need a second chance. You need a substitute. What you need is someone to take the test for you and get it right. You don't need a second chance. You don't need a better resume. What you need is you need a savior. And you have a savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen, church? And he's also called, guess, guess what he's called? He's called the Lion of Judah. Will you stand with me? Let me pray over you. Father God, I know there's people in here who are struggling with their resumes, wondering if there's any way past this. You brought them here today to hear this word. You're not asking them to do better. You're not asking them to try harder. You're asking them to bow and receive from Jesus amazing grace. So God, help us to hear in a fresh way right now the good news that someone has paid the crime that we committed. They have paid the price for us, that the slate is clean right now and forever and ever because of the blood of the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name, the whole church said, amen. Can we give God the praise for that Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins? If there's any way it can be a blessing, our team is up here. We'd love to pray about you for whatever it is. Maybe you want to get your life right with God. Maybe you have a prayer request, whatever it is. We're going to sing a song called The Lion and the Lamb. Let me read the lyrics real quick. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Amen, church? Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Please come as we worship him together right now.
How many believe that this morning? Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Yeah, yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Don't forget about those Thanksgiving blessing bags. Go out there and grab one. Let's be a blessing this Thanksgiving. Before you leave, I want you to receive the blessing right now. Please open up your hands like this. Receive the blessing. May the Lord continue to bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to make his face shine upon you with favor and give you peace. May the Lord continue to be gracious to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, love you, RCC. Go live in his grace. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.